I want to thank God for the message this morning. Somebody says, brother, you didn't even preach yet. That's because I'm already aware of the message. It watered my heart. I am learning to rest in God's love. And it brings a peace that passes all understanding. And the perplexed present truther needs this. I marvel at how much truth for this time we know, but it still has not had its corresponding effect upon bringing peace in our hearts and in our homes. I understand the crisis, and God just simply wants to make it plain. And so we're going to talk about a very important, essential need that we all have to have. And the need was spelled out very simply last night. It's Christ-likeness, holiness. It is the key way that we are going to prepare a people to meet their God. And so as we prepare our minds to receive the word, let's go ahead and let's do that upon our knees. If you're able to, let's kneel together. If you can't kneel, just reverently bow your heads where you are. But let us all pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you once again for the wonderful gift of life. And I really appreciate what my sister said earlier. The purpose of praying for healing and for rejoicing in the gift of health and life is that we might better serve you and to serve one another. Father, I stand in 100% agreement with that statement. Lord, please give us what we need so we can finally be instruments in your hand in ministering to the needs of humanity. It's our prayer that we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. This is the command of God. This is what God is saying to his people that we are to say to the world. Prepare your hearts, prepare your homes, for our Lord cometh. You know, we have satellites that are getting almost everywhere around the globe. People are hearing the message. I remember being at a church, predominantly Indian, in Maryland. And when I was there, I was giving the word. And I was teaching about the first, the second, and the third angel's message. And as I was going step by step and point by point through those wonderful truths, I made an appeal to the congregation. Had a large turnout that night. It was wonderful. And many people gave their hearts to the Lord. And so when we were done, the brothers came over to me and they said, oh, Brother Lemon, praise the Lord. So many people gave their hearts to Jesus. And I said, amen. You know, and I'm thinking I'm saying amen because I saw what he saw. So, you know, I saw the people respond, too. So I was rejoicing. He said, no, you don't understand. He said, we, because they had these unique looking cameras. I never seen them before. Real high tech stuff. And they said, no, we were providing a feed where individuals in certain Muslim, highly intense Islamic areas in India where individuals are not able to openly publicly worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Individuals were meeting in a basement and 25 Muslim men gave their hearts to Jesus and accepted the third angel's message tonight. And I thought to myself, I said, praise God for technology. Though it be a tool for much evil, thank God it can be a tool for good. As a result of the internet, as a result of satellites, as a result of faithful missionaries who understand that sometimes their mission is a one-way ticket to life. There are many who have heard the everlasting gospel and have accepted it. And sometimes I know how it is, you know, when we don't see a lot, you know, some of us are YouTubers. Some of us are, are audio verse 
folks, and we, we go to networks and we feel like, oh, there's only a handful that are standing for the truths of this time. But I thank God for volume five of the Testimonies to the Church, page 80, where it tells us very clearly that there are stars that during the daytime, you cannot see them, but they're there. But it's only at nighttime. That's when the stars shine. My point is very simple. You watch out and make sure you don't end up with the Elijah syndrome. I'm the only one standing for the truth, Lord, and there's nobody else. God says, I have many lights that have not bowed their knees to Baal. And they will best be discerned when the night comes. And my brothers and sisters, midnight is on its way. That's why last night we were talking about prophecy. Again, it's, it's, it's to the point that God is just constantly reminding us time is almost finished. And God's going to have a whole lot of light bearers that's going to come out of the woodworks. And a lot of the light bearers are not necessarily the ones you're seeing on YouTube. They're not necessarily the ones that you're hearing on Audioverse. They're not necessarily the ones that are in all of the great public places of the world. We're told that the time is not far distant when the test will come to every soul. The mark of the beast will be urged upon us. And those who have step by step yielded to worldly demands and have conformed to worldly customs will not find it a hard matter to yield to the powers that be rather than suffer derision, danger, threatened imprisonment, insult and death. It says, at that time, the gold will be separated from the dross in the church. True godliness will be distinguished from the appearance and tinsel of it. And then it says those very startling words that I know makes me check my heart every day. It says, many a star that we have admired for their brilliancy will go out in darkness. Some of us have fixed our minds so much on people. I meet these young missionaries. Young missionaries, they bless their hearts. Now, I consider myself a young missionary. I just need you to understand. But there's younger missionaries. And some of these younger missionaries, you know, I, I, I like them. They demonstrate how pliable they are. In other words, so easily bent one way or the other. I meet young men that look, act, talk, walk, and even dress like the ministers they listen to. I am serious. They look, they act, they talk, they walk, they even dress like their ministers. When they preach, they preach with the same movements like their favorite evangelists. It's very typical in young people, especially when they don't have a foundation. Did you hear what I just said? It's very typical of young people. But what kind of young people? Especially the ones that have no foundation. They don't know their own individuality in Jesus. And so they act and function and talk and dress and preach and teach like the people around them. And the problem is, is what if that individual that is so incredibly impressing and molding your mind, what if that's one of the bright stars that's going to go out? That means we got young people that are preparing to go out as well because they were not rooted and grounded in Christ, their righteousness. And so God wants us to understand that the message is going out, the word is getting out, but obviously there's something still more that God wants. And I know what he wants. And I would imagine you do too, or you, at least you should, because we just read it in John 15. Let's go back there. You see, in John... In fact, before we go to John 15, let's put a little bit more context. Go to Revelation 18. Let's go to Revelation 18, and then we'll go to John 15. Revelation 18 first, and then we'll go to John 15. It is true that we are called of God to prepare ye the way of the Lord. Prepare you. You and I are to prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. In doing that, a great proclamation as well as demonstration is to be given. Now, the Bible shows us the last proclamation, the last message by which we are preparing the way of the Lord. It shows the last one that's going to be given in this earth's history. It's right here in Revelation 18. 
And the Bible says in Revelation 18, starting at verse 1, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have wa waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people that you not be not partakers of her sins and that you receive not of her plagues. This is the last effort of preparing the way of the Lord. It's the loud cry. It's what God should be impressing your heart and my heart to preparing to give. That should be tantamount. That, that should be the number one thing in our mind is, Lord, how can you best prepare my heart, my home, that we might be fit to give the loud cry of the third angel's message. That's what we should be preparing for. This should be our focus. This is the focus of our education. This is the focus of the books that we read. This is the focus of the schools that we set up. Everything is designed to impart an education that we know how to function in this world, but more importantly, that we know how to receive the truths for this time and let it have its practical, sanctifying effect on yours and my life so that whatever career or whatever it is that I do in life, I understand that I'm never an employee and I'm never simply a business owner. I'm a messenger of light wherever I'm going. Wherever I'm going, I'm a messenger of light. You go to work, you understand I'm going to work to be a messenger of light. You go to school, you understand I'm going to school to be a messenger of light. That is the foundation of true education. And so it is that God says this is the last message. Now, remember, what are these people doing to the earth? According to Revelation 18, they're lighting the earth up with what? Oh, come on and say it like you study the Bible. What is it that these people are doing on the earth? According to Revelation 18, they're lighting the earth up with what? With the glory of God. The blessed, wonderful, beautiful character of God. That's what we're doing. Lighting up the earth with it. Now, in order for us to light up the earth with the glory of God, go back to John 15. Now look at it. The Bible is very clear. In John, the 15th chapter, let us notice God's preparatory steps in enabling us that we might glorify him. The Bible makes it very clear in John 15. We're going to look at verses 1 to 3 again, our scripture reading. It said, I am the true vine. My father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he does what with it? He takes it away. Question real quick. What does that mean when he says he takes it away? Cuts it off. What, is it, what does he do? With, what does he do when he cuts? What he cuts it off and does what with it? He discards it. He gets rid of it. Is that right? Is that right? Is that right? You're wrong. Isn't that deep? You can think you're so right when you're wrong. Notice this. You didn't. There are two words. See, that's what I'm saying. I'm telling you, the Lord is teaching us how to study. There are two words that we missed. The two words, let's look at it again in verse two. It says, every branch, what's the next two words? Amen. How can you be sent away if you're in Christ? How could you be in Christ and, and be gotten rid of at the same time? Now, let's do contrast. Verse six, go down to verse six. What does it say in verse six? It says, if a man does what? Ah, what happens if a man abides not in me? What does it say? It says, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered and men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. Do you get that? You see, if I'm a branch and I'm in Christ, but I'm not bearing fruit, 
he does something different. But when I'm a branch that's not abiding in Christ, then I wither. And then I'm cut off and thrown into the fire. You see, if you ever look up the term taken away, I understand English, you know, English messes us up sometimes. That's why it is imperative. If you're going to be a good Bible student. You have to sometimes reference the Hebrew, the Aramaic or the Greek. Sometimes you just got to do it. Now, if you were to look up the term taken away in John 15 two, what it means is build up. Any branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, I build him back up. Now, you know, there's a farmer in the room, I would imagine. Is there a farmer here? All right. So if you're a farmer or a gardener, when you set up vines, grapevines, have you ever noticed that sometimes the branches get caught in the dirt? Sometimes if you don't take care of that vine properly, if you don't take care of it, can the branches end up falling into the dirt? And they can. And you know, when the branches are falling into the dirt, they get very dirty. And it can prohibit it from growing fruit. So what do we do, farmers, when we see the branch laying in the dirt, covered with dirt, unable to bear fruit? What do we do with it? We, we lift it up. We build it up. We clean it up. We put it in right position so that now it can bear fruit. Do you understand that? Any branch that, thank God, is still at least in Christ, though not bearing fruit, God does not get rid of it. You see, depending on how we study the Bible, we might look at God as a gangster. We might look at him as a roughneck. We might look at him as an unreasonable, tough guy that if you don't meet his standards, he gets rid of you. That's not the picture of our Savior. When he doesn't see fruit in yours and my life, though we are making efforts to abide in him, he does not say no fruit uh, and gets rid of us. That's not the God of heaven and earth. Please don't paint that picture of your heavenly father. Especially mine. God does not treat us like empty object toilet paper that you just use and get rid of it. When he sees you're down, he reaches over to build you up. In the military, when you see somebody go down, when they get hit, we say, man down, man down, and everybody comes together to build that man back up. When there's a cancer cell that's in the body, the rest of the cells say, man down, man down, let's go, that we might build them up, even though some of us as cells may lose our lives trying to save the body. Lessons from physiology. Today, there's a culture that says, man down, minister down, evangelist down, people getting caught up in apostasy. And the message is, get away. Leave them alone. Pray for them, minister, from, minister for them from a very, 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 very large distance. And tell them they need to get it right while I'm busy building up the branches that are already up. Man, I hope you get what I'm saying. We're back in John 15. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And then watch that. Once he builds us up, then it says, and every branch that bears fruit. So he builds you up. Now you're bearing fruit. Now what does he do next? He purges you. What does purge mean? What does purge mean? To cut, cut, trim, bruise. Is that right? That's not what it means. The word purge is the very word that you find in verse 3. What is the word in verse 3? Now you are clean. clean. The word purge means to cleanse. And so it is that it says, and every branch that beareth fruit, he cleanses it, that it may do what? Bring forth more fruit. Why does God want so much fruit? Verse 8. What does it say in verse 8? It says right there in verse 8, it says, 
Herein is my Father, what? Glorified. That? The only people who are going to light up the earth with God's glory are the people that are bearing much fruit. You got that? It's all about fruit bearing. Got to bear some fruit, family. God wants us to understand that this means everything to him. Now, when we think of fruit, what do you think of? You think of the fruit of the, the fruit of the spirit. What's the fruit of the spirit? The fruit of the spirit is love. What else? Joy. What else? Peace. What else? Long suffering. What else? Gentleness. What else? Goodness. What else? Faith. What else? Meekness. What else? Temperance. And how does the verse finish? Against such. You ever think about that? You ever think about that? Do you know that everything in our world has law? Is eating a privilege? But isn't there a law? You're only supposed to eat a certain amount, lest you be full and vomit. Remember that? Proverbs 25, 16, eat thou honey. Well, Proverbs 24, 13, eat thou honey because it's good. But then Proverbs 25, 16 says, hast thou found honey? Only eat it in sufficient amounts, lest thou be filled therewith and vomit. Honey is good to eat, but there's a law that says you only got to eat a certain amount. Money making. There's a law. Did you know that? Somebody said money making. When you get a chance, go back and look at Proverbs 30, verses 7 to 9. Uh, actually, verse 10, too. It, Solomon says, two things have I required of thee. Deny me them not before I die. Now, listen to what Solomon says. Two things have I required of thee. Deny me them not before I die. Then he says, give me neither. I want you to think about that. He says, give me neither what? Poverty nor riches. Literally, the Bible says labor not to be rich. So notice that he says, two things have I required of thee. Deny me them not before I die. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Then he says, feed me with food convenient for me. Lest, now watch the verse. He says, lest I be full. And then he says, and deny thee and say, who is the Lord? Now watch this. When he says, lest I be full, he wasn't just talking about the belly. He was also talking about the context of being rich. The danger of being rich is that we are, think that we are increased with goods. We are full and have need of nothing. He says, that's the danger of being rich. But then he also says, neither give me poverty. The next verse says, See, people don't pay for, some of us, we gloat in our poverty. I'm broke, amen. And it's like, well, hold up. I don't know if God says amen with you. Inspiration, this was not Solomon saying, inspiration, stay over here and let humanity kick in. Give me neither. That was inspired. The Holy Spirit was saying that to say to Solomon, to say to you and to say to me, my goal is not to be rich. My goal is not to be poor. My goal is to be right there in the middle. And isn't that interesting that according to prophecy, that's the very group that's being wiped out is the middle class. That's top news on CNN. That's top news on Newsweek. That's top news on Money Market. That's the thing is right now the middle class is getting wiped out and we got one or two choices. You want to survive? You better get rich. And then when you get rich and then the beast power comes and says, surrender your riches, you're going to be like Lot's wife. Or you want to survive? Well, if you're not going to be rich, then we're going to have to make you poor. And then you're going to be tempted to lie and steal and go into all sorts of sins just to live and try to sanctify your lies. And that's why God says, I got a plan. Get out of the city. Get into the country. Get a little piece of land. He says, I want you to grow some food. Learn to simplify your life. God's God has a plan to deal with the elimination of the middle class and the pressure to put us in one of the two classes that's preparing us to be pressured by the beast power. God has a plan for everything. God wants you and I to understand balance. The balance of his word. He says, I want you to bear much fruit. And the reason why is because he said that's how you're going to 
glorify me. And what is that wonderful fruit? Love, joy, peace, long suffering, etc. In other words, there's a law for everything. Even though eating is a privilege, there's a law. Even though drinking is a privilege, there's a law. Even though making money is a privilege, there's a law. But against these, God says, no law. God says, indulge. God says, overeat in love. God says you can indulge in joy. God says you can have overdo it abundant peace. There's no law. There's no such thing as you are just too peaceful. There's no such thing. You ever see that in the verse? Is it, am I the only one? This, I mean, I'm literally looking at the verse like, against such, there is no law. God says there's no limit to love. You can love as much as you want. You can have joy as much as you want. You can have peace. You can be as long suffering with people as much as you want. No limit. God says, I want much of that. And if you really think about it, what is the much of the fruit at the end of the day? Check this out. This was very powerful. Did you know Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit? Is that right? Luke 1 35, that holy thing. And the angel answered and said unto her, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore, also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the son of God. So I started looking at Jesus, right? Did you know Jesus is love? Jesus had joy. Jesus had peace. Jesus was long suffering. Jesus was gentle. Jesus was good. Jesus is our source of faith. Jesus was meek and Jesus was temperate. When you think of the fruit of the spirit, you're thinking nothing short of Christ likeness. Keeping it simple. When God says there's no law against being like Jesus. There's no law. God says, I want you to flourish with his character. I want you to just manifest his character in such a marked way because that's what the world needs to be lit up with. That's what the world needs to see in unadulterated form. No fogginess. Take the glasses off and see it crystal clear and plain. Christ says, I want a reflection of my character. This is why we're told in inspiration, the object of the Christian life is fruit bearing. That's the object of our lives is fruit bearing the reproduction of Christ's character in the believer that it may be reproduced in others. Christ object lessons, page 67. That's the great focus. Fruit. God has no problem letting people in his house that are just like his son. It's when we're not like his son that he has concerns. Because God is not trying to have a Lucifer part two. He's not trying to have that. And the only way he can be secure from having that is to make sure that you and I got characters like Jesus. You understand that? So this is the great thing. This is the great focus. This is what God wants. And this is the experience. This is the essential experience that you and I must have. And the question is very, very simple. God wants us to bear fruit. It's the fruit of Christ-like character. It's the only way that we can glorify him on the earth and eventually light up the earth with his glory. It's the only way it's going to happen. Now, the question is very simple. Why does God want us to bear fruit? Why does he want us to manifest this Christ-like character? Why does he want us to bear fruit? What do you think? To be like him? That might be like him. True that. Anything else? True that. <laughs> Glorify him. He wants to be in us. OK, good answers. All right. And bring others to him. Let's go to Isaiah 55 and let's look at from the Bible why God wants us to bear fruit. Let's look at it. Isaiah, the 55th chapter. In Isaiah 55. I taught this at the graduation at Wildwood a couple of weeks, a few weeks ago. And I think that this is worthy to repeat. In the book of Isaiah, let's look at the 55th chapter and watch, watch how God, you know, he helps us understand why he wants us 
to bear fruit. I like this, how God uses these examples. So when you look at Isaiah 55, notice what it says in verse 9. We'll look at verses 9 and 10. The Bible says, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now watch verse 10. For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but does what to the earth? It waters the earth and makes it bring forth. What do you think is making it bring forth? Fruit. Make forth fruit and bud that it may do two things. What does it do? Seed to the sower. And what else? Bread to the eater. That's why God wants you to bear fruit. I'm just giving you Bible answers. I want to make it more specific, more plain. Why does God want us to bear fruit? That I might give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. That's why he wants you to bear fruit. We're getting practical on how do we prepare the way of the Lord? How do we help people see and prepare to meet their God? How do I make sure me, my family, are preparing to meet our God? God says, I want you to bear fruit. Why, Lord, do you want me to bear fruit? He says, because I want you to give seed to the sower and I want you to give bread to the eater. Now, scholars in the room, what does that mean? What does that mean? We just found out biblically why God gives or has fruit production. The purpose of fruit in the type, in the, in the natural world, is to do two things. To give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Now, is that hard to, to understand when we think about farming and gardening? No, that makes all the sense in the world. Because if it doesn't give seed to the sower, we're going to get stuck in what's called the hybrid world. All these man-made seeds and all these manipulated seeds, Monsanto and all these guys. And we don't want that stuff, right? We want the heirloom products. Is that right? Okay, so if we want the heirloom products, then the sower needs more seeds. I mean, does that make sense? That makes sense. If we want good, healthy heirloom foods, that product has to give me, the sower, more seeds so I can plant more. Who's the sower? In the, okay, in the natural world, who's the sower? The farmer or the gardener? What did you just read in John 15? Who's the vine? Who's the husbandman? What's another way of saying the husbandman? The farmer or the gardener. So again, who's the sower? God is. You understand that? God's the sower. All right. So what God says is he says, I want you to bear much fruit so you can give me more seed that I can produce more fruit. You understand that? How do we do that? Revelation 2, verse 10. Look at Revelation 2 and look at a principle in verse 10. This is one of many ways. And I have some deeper things that I want to share, so I'm not going to spend too much time at this point, but I just want to get the point across. Revelation 2, look at verse 10. This, this is a spiritual way, if you will, that we can give seed to the sower. God does not need us for anything. In, in the context of he cannot function without us. He needs our companionship and he wants our companionship because he is love and love always communes one with another. So God needs us in that context, but he doesn't need us for the purpose of survival. You understand that? Now, when God therefore gets seed from us, the purpose is to produce more fruit, get more seeds, produce more fruit, get more seeds, produce more fruit. You understand that? That's the purpose of the seed going to the sower. So let's study, it, study that in that context. Revelation 2 and verse 10. The Bible says in Revelation 2 and verse 10, it says, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou what? Be thou faithful unto death, and then what will happen? you will receive the crown of life. Now notice this. When we are faithful unto God till the end, only that we get that. But in addition to that, when we are faithful unto death, it, it, it is as it were seed given to God that he encourages the next generation to be faithful unto death. Are you following? 
Have you ever thought, why does God let Christians get killed? In truth, it doesn't make any sense except for one point. God says, I am allowing things to happen even to my people. That as they were faithful unto death, the next generation that comes will also be faithful unto death. You know why I know this to be true? One day I was reading a little book, Great Controversy, and as I was going through it, I was studying the, the chapter on God's people delivered. And when, when it got to a point that Jesus says those wonderful words of Revelation 22, 11, when he says, let him who's holy be holy still and let him who's filthy be filthy still. When Christ says that probation closes, the reason we know that is because Revelation 15, 8, verse 8 is the last verse in the book of Revelation 15. And the last verse in Revelation 15, verse 8, it says the sanctuary was filled with smoke and no man could enter into it. Who is the only man that could enter into the sanctuary? That's only the priest, right? And if it's the most holy place, it's only the high priest. Now, if the sanctuary is filled with smoke and no man can enter in, then that means that the only man that would go in is none other than our high priest. Who's our high priest? Jesus. Jesus. So Hebrews 7.25 says that he ever liveth to intercess for us. But he does that in the sanctuary. So if the sanctuary is filled with smoke and no man can enter into it, then that means that intercession at that point has ceased. Do you understand? That's why God says, let him who's holy be holy still. Let him who's filthy. People are going to live in the sight of a holy God without an intercessor, without a mediator. But it'd be one thing if after Revelation 15, 8, it then shows Jesus comes. But is that what happens? No. Then there's Revelation 16, 1. And in Revelation 16, 1, that's when the angels come down with the vials of wrath and they begin to pour out the seven last plagues. So there will be a people on earth who are going to go through a time of Jacob's trouble without a mediator in the sanctuary. That's why, thank God, they're going to not only be holy, but they're going to be holy still. God has already weighed their characters and he knows they will never turn their back on me. Don't you want to be counted amongst that number? Yes. Amen. And so in that little chapter, God's people delivered, it says at that time when God's people are still alive, probation has closed. People are getting hit with plagues and there's a worldwide death decree that says kill all these faithful people? Question, do they get killed? No. no, you know why? Because there's no other generation that needs to be evangelized. All of humanity has been assessed from faithful Adam to the last judgment of the living and judgment of the dead. And so that means the only reason that God allowed his people to be slaughtered was as it were that it might be seed to produce more people who will be faithful unto death. Then they get cut down, then it's like seed that produces more people that are faithful unto death until we get to the close of probation. And God says, nobody touches my people anymore. Because there's no need. The mission has been accomplished. Our faithfulness unto God is as it were giving him seed that he can encourage others do as you have saw seen your brothers do but it also says bread to the eater didn't it so it gives seed to the sower but then bread to the eater so i thought about the bread to the eater part and this one i said let me put some text on the screen so look at this galatians 6 1 and 2 brethren if a man be overtaken in a fault ye which are spiritual Restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Then what does he say? Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. You know, I thought Jesus was the burden bearer. But what did God tell us to do? You ever run away from people? Because it's like, look, that burden, uh, no, I can't deal with it. You know, let me point you to Jesus for that. Now, I'm not saying that's holistically wrong, but what I am saying is that did you know that it was not a suggestion? It was a command of God that we are to bear one another's burdens. You know the reason why a lot of us cannot bear other people's burdens? According to the text. 
we're not spiritual. You see, God put that there on purpose. When you see another brother that's overtaken in the fall, you are supposed to be spiritual. What is spiritual? John 4, 24. God says God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. If I'm spiritual, then that means that I should be like God. I should have a mind, character, personality like God himself. Ye which are spiritual, restore such a one. One of the reasons why we cannot help other people with their burdens is many a times because we're not a very spiritual people because some of us are sometimes very self-centered. Somebody, look, I got enough problems of my own. God says, I knew that when I called you. <laughs> the problem is, is you're not allowing me to make your burdens light. And that's why you can't bear anybody else's burdens. Oh, it's so simple. There are other people literally dying around us, sick around us and hurting around us that need real help. And God is saying, I appointed you to help them. And we're saying, Lord, I can't. When the Bible says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Oh, ye of little faith. God says, I expect you to bear one another's burdens in the strength of Jesus. I was counseling a family the other day, earlier in the week, you know, as ministers, we go home and do visitations with various families. And I was sitting with a family and they started to tell me some deep challenges they're going through. And the brother said, Brother Lemon, I need help. Would you be willing to help me? I said, I will be willing to help you. I said, you just have to understand the context of my help. He said, what do you mean? I said, listen, if you are falling and if you're being overwhelmed by the devil and you feel that like you are about to pass out, I'm going to hold you and I'm going to carry you. I said, but I need you to understand that what I'm going to do is when I hold you and when I carry you, I'm going to carry you and I'm going to walk you to Jesus and I'm going to say, Lord, carry him. And I literally did this example in front of him. I said, in other words, every time you come to me, I'm going to bring you into my arms and I'm going to put you in Jesus's arms. Because I want to teach you how to learn to rely on him. And I don't want you to develop a habit of relying on me. Number one, because I'm flesh and I can fail. Number two, I can die. I cannot be here anymore. And I don't want you to be to feel stranded. So we bear each other's burdens, carrying them to the great burden bearer. You understand that? That's how you don't get overwhelmed. I will help you to be helped by Jesus. You understand that? That's the context of how we bear each other's burden. God is not asking you take on the load of other people's lives because some of us are so messed up. We are a real burden. And therefore, we're like, Lord, I got to deal with my own issues. And now I got this person too. Lord, it's overwhelming. Christ says, just understand you're going to bring them into your arms, but you're going to put them in my arms. So I need to start teaching you how to learn on my strength. And this is what our study is about. So watch this. So look at this point right here. Jude 22 and 23. And of some have compassion, making a difference. And others do what? Save with fear, doing what? Pulling them out of the fire. Who do you know got pulled out the fire? Oh, come on, Bible students. Who do you know that got pulled out the fire? Lot. Fire was coming down. You remember that dangerous word that caused Lot's wife to die? The Bible says in Genesis 19, it says Lot lingered. Husbands, all right, let's take a second. Husbands. Our wives look to us for strength and they are supposed to. We are called to be three things in our home, men. The lawmaker the head, and the priest. Those are the three things God called us to be. When we are the head, the lawmaker, and the priest of our home, those are all positions of leadership. The wife is supposed to look to the husband for leadership. The children are to look to father for leadership. And so, when the leader is called to do something that God tells them to do, they are to, yes, sir, immediately obey and follow what God says. Lot did not do that. The Bible says that when God called the leader and said, Lot, let's go. It says Lot lingered. His wife saw it. And his wife was like, if my husband's lingering, then maybe there's a reason we shouldn't go forward. 
And so even though Lot snapped out of it and started making his move, his wife was like, but my husband did make that move. I mean, what's going on? And when she looked back, that was the end of her life. It was not just because she was a covetous woman, even though that was true, but it was the example of her husband that laid the foundation for the loss of her eternal salvation. And so it is that when those angels said, we got to go, we got to go, and Lot lingered and all of this stuff, what did the angels do? They grabbed their hand and pulled them out of the fire. They said, we got to get you out of here. Let's go. God says, I expect you to do that with your people. You see, bread to the eater. What do we do with food? We eat it, and it gets assimilated in our system, and it gives us strength to go forward. Is that right? Look at this. In tender, pitying love, lay hold of the discouraged and helpless ones. Give them your your, your, wait a minute. God says, give them your courage. Give them your hope. Give them your strength. This is what we do with the discouraged and helpless ones. It says, by kindness, compel them to come. Of some, have compassion, making a difference in others, save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. You see, sometimes the only way people will go forward is when they can partake of some of your bread. They're going to have to see something in your life that testifies. Parents, this is the secret. Some of us scratch our heads. Why are my children so rebellious? Why are my children won't listen? They're so happy with a pretense of holiness. But I know that they have not the love of God in their hearts. God says, parents, mother and father, listen to me. Search your heart and find out every area you are frustrating me. Search your heart and find out every area where you are constantly not letting me have dominion completely in your life. And God says, and once you surrender to me, your children will be partakers of your bread. But if they see cheating in the home, and we got to understand, listen, he who is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. When we cheat on small things in front of our children, our children are like fiber optic network, glass speed, high speed internet download. I mean, our children are like, when they, when they see us cheat, when they see us compromise, when they see us gossip, when they see us lie, when they see us overindulge in appetite, when they see us do anything that is contrary to the counsels we give them, it's like a download. And they're like, whoop, and it's high-speed download. They get it quick. And they're like, oh, that's what mom and dad taught me. All right, I shall be the same. And what they'll do is simply say, what you do undercover, I'll do it in the open. And this is why sometimes we as parents, we, we, we get floored when we start seeing things happening with our children and they get involved in all these public social networks, et cetera, and it gets really bad. My brothers and sisters, what I'm saying to you is that God is like, I can change all of that. But you must learn how to give your children. You must learn how to give your brothers and sisters. You must learn how to give the people in society. We must learn to give them our courage, our hope, our strength. True story. And I hope you don't mind. You know, the only reason why I don't... Um, I, I'm always challenged to speak of these uh, certain events because, like Brother Mason used to say, y'all pray for that clock, <laughs> you know, because I'm trying to give you meat. I'm really trying to give you meat, and I don't want the pressure of a clock around me. I know when the Spirit of God is leading, so just work with me, family. Listen, in November of 2016, I go and I get checked out for my heart. Why? In 2015, I'm by a friend's house. My wife and I go to see a friend, and she happens to work in the cardiology department. And she works in the cardiology department, and she has a portable echocardiogram in her house. She says to my wife, she says, Hun you know, Alex, I'm going to check you out, and this, that, and the other. And then she says, hey, Dwayne, since you're here, why don't you let me take a look at what's going on with your heart? And I'm like, sure. I know I'm fine. So, you know, I'm like, whatever. So they go ahead and they check my heart. 
She checks my heart, and I'm waiting for the report. Like, all right, you know, how am I doing? I'm doing great, right? She says, well, um, your heart looks really big on the left side. Like, it didn't even fit on my screen. And I was like, really? Am I dying? She says, no, 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 you're fine. You know, you got LVE, LAE, and she starts using all these terms. She says, just, you know, in a year, go see your cardiologist. So fast forward a year. That's how I saw my cardiologist. I would have never gone to see my cardiologist were it not for that encounter at my friend Linda's house. I go to see the cardiologist. I said, listen, man, my, my friend told me to check it out because my heart's a little big on the left side. Tell me what's going on. Keep in mind, I feel fantastic. They said any man that's over 40 years old and can do a brisk walk in less than 28 minutes and cover over two miles has excellent fitness. I was doing it in 26.33 seconds. So you understand that I'm walking in the office like, I'm good. Check me out. He checks me out, puts me on the screen. Mr. Lemon, you see that thing there that looks like a broken hockey stick? I said, yeah. He said, that's your mitral valve. He says, I'm used to seeing that in 80-year-olds. He said, what happened to you? I said, I had rheumatic fever when I was a child. Ah. Lo and behold, he says, Mr. Lemon, it's not that your left Heart, the left side of your heart is big. He said it's your left atrium. He said your left atrium is severely dilated. You can go into atrial fibrillation at any time. I have to refer you to a heart surgeon. Fast forward through a whole lot of events. I saw my heart surgeon. My wife and I prayed the night before and my son Jared. My son said, Father, you sent us to California. My son said this. You know what my son gave me? And I told him this. I said, son, you know what you gave me that night? He said, what? I said, you gave me your courage. You gave me your hope. You gave me your strength. Because I was getting weak. And my son said, father, you said that you brought us here for a repair, not for a replacement of daddy's valve. Tomorrow when they meet with the doctor, show yourself mighty on behalf of my parents. I went in there, my wife and I went in, and Dr. Wong says, Mr. Lemon, not only is your mitral valve severely regurgitating, he says your aortic valve is regurgitating. He said, Mr. Lemon, I cannot do a repair on this valve. I can only do mechanical, and you're going to have to be on Coumadin for the rest of your life. I said, Dr. Wong, can I tell you a story? Yes. I said, Dr. Wong, there was a man who went to London. He went to go preach. He went to bed Friday night getting ready to wake up Saturday morning to preach. And when he went to bed Friday night, he didn't wake up. His heart completely stopped and he didn't get oxygen to his brain for over 30 minutes. I said, what's the prognosis of that man? Oh, he's dead. He's dead. He's, gonna, he's dead. If not dead, he's definitely going to be a vegetable. I said, I would agree. But that dead vegetable man is going to be here Monday for my surgery in sound mind and body. His name is Thomas Jackson. I said, God did a miracle for him. And then I looked him in the eyes with his wife standing right there. I said, Dr. Wong, do you believe that God can do a miracle with your hands and repair the valve that has been known to be irreparable? And you know what he said to me? He said, I'll do it. And I said, amen. We went to have the follow-up meeting. He said, Dwayne, are you sure you want to do this? I said, I'm sure. He said, I don't have your faith. I said, lean on mine. That's what I said to him. I pulled a picture out. Nathan Green, Jesus in the surgery room. I said, this is going to happen on December 19, 2016. He said, all right, let's go forward. I stand before you 11 months later feeling fantastic with a repaired valve. What I'm saying to you is we must understand that God tells us to bear fruit so we can give bread to those who eat. There are times that people are not going to have courage. They need yours. There are going to be times people do not have hope. They need yours. There are going to be times people do not have strength. They need yours. Do you understand how devastating it is when we get up every morning and neglect worship? Not only are we hurting ourselves, we cannot give to those whom we love our hope, strength, and courage because we don't have any. 
You can't live off of yesterday's blessings. Your blessings you got yesterday was for yesterday. I don't care how powerful it was. You are not supposed to live off of yesterday's blessings. Jesus says, continue in my words. You understand that? So this is why God wants us to bear fruit, to give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Now, how are we going to do this? Here's the secret. The Savior's life on earth was a life of what? Communion with nature and with God. In this communion, he revealed for us what? The secret of a life of power. If we can learn how to have communion like Jesus did, we will have the power Jesus had. And we'll be able to live as he lived and minister as he ministered. Are you aware of that? This is what Christ enables us to do. And so what I want us to understand is that when we begin delving into the word, I want us to look at some principles about Jesus. And as we look at the principles about Jesus and how he lived in his communion life, Christ says, I gave that to you as my example. And it was not optional. The Bible says in Hebrews 11 and verse six, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder that diligently seeks him. Now, if you were a student of the Bible, I imagine you have theology taught here, right? You have a theology class at Heartland? All right, good. So in theology class, I would imagine you had to learn about parallelism. Is that right? Now, in parallelism, parallelism is very simple. It is making one point being stated in two or more ways. Making one singular point, but you're expressing it in two or more ways. Hebrews 11.6 is an example of parallelism because notice the two words that are parallel. It says, but without what? Faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe. believe that he is. So literally, believe and faith mean the same thing in this verse. Do you understand that? Now, to make it more simple, the word believe, if you looked it up even in the Greek, it means to have faith. But better is at the bottom. What does it say at the bottom in yellow? To trust. Many people believe God, but very few trust him. The Bible says even the devils believe, but they don't trust. Do you know that there are some of us who believe, but we don't trust God? We believe, but we don't necessarily trust. Let me give you something here. A powerful parallel about believing God. What does it really mean to believe or trust God? Watch this. John 5 and verse 38, and ye have not his word abiding in you for whom he has sent him ye believe not. What is it that they did not believe? His word. Very good. They did not believe his word. So therefore, because they didn't believe the word, they didn't believe Christ. You follow that? Let me do it again. Second example. John 5, 46. For had ye believed who? Moses, you would have believed me for he. You see, when we reject the written word of God is hard to accept the living word of God. True trust in God is in its simplicity. Faith is fully trusting God's word to come to pass because he said it and depending only on the word to do what God said it will do. This is faith. Matthew chapter eight. Notice what the Bible says. Matthew, the eighth chapter. Watch the text. Jesus lived by the word. Jesus prayed in harmony with the word. Jesus's whole life was based on the word. And therefore, he says, you and I should live according to the word. Now, again, Matthew chapter five, the Bible says in Matthew five, right there and starting at verse five. And let's notice what it says. If you're there, just let me know by saying amen. Okay, Matthew chapter 5. No, I'm sorry, Matthew 8. Forgive me. Matthew 8. And then we're looking at verse 5. Matthew 8 and verse 5. It says, And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion, beseeching him, and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. Je understand, Jesus said, I will come to his house. I'll come to your house. I'll heal him. How many of you would love that Jesus walk to your home? 
But, but watch how this brother rejects the offer. Jesus says, I will come and heal him. Let's go through the rest of the story now. He says, I will come and heal him. Verse 8, the centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof. But speak the word. What's that next word? Only. only. Speak the word only. And my servant might be healed. My servant shall be healed. Now watch this. My servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. I wish I could spend time on verse 9. That's a serious verse. You, know, I, you need to understand what that brother's saying. But nevertheless, he says, For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, Go, and he goeth. And to another man, Come, and he cometh. And to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. And when Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. Literally, Jesus just told us what faith is. What did he do? That's an open book test because it's on the screen. What did he do? He trusted fully in the word of God only and depended fully on the word of God only for the word of God to do what it said it was going to do. That's faith. Jesus says, I need my people to start living like this. And you know one of the great reasons why we can't live like this? You know the great reason why many of us cannot live like this? Because some of us know more of Ellen White than we know the Bible. I'm going to take a drink on that one. Now, if Ellen White was resurrected out of the grave, she slapped me a high five. You know why? Great Controversy 598, she says, but God will have a people that will use the Bible and the Bible only as the basis of all doctrines and the foundation of all reforms. Do you know how many of us do not know how to go to the Bible to spell out dress reform? We run to Ellen White, don't we? Some of us, we don't know how to show country living from the Bible. We only know how to pro pro quote country living page nine. Some of, listen, and I'm not saying this to insult. What I'm saying is, is that we got to do things in proper perspective. Some of us are absolutely lazy. We don't like to stretch our brains. We don't like to think through a text because there's nothing that'll make you think like studying the Bible. There's nothing that'll stretch your brain like the Bible. And the prophet knew that. And that's why she wrote it in the book, Education. And she said, there is nothing that will expand the mind like the study of scripture. And so what do we do? I don't understand what this verse is. And we just immediately run to the Ellen White. And what I'm saying, you miss the blessing God wanted to give you. God wanted you to study. If you look back at the days of our pioneers, they did not get together at night and study the Bible and say, we don't know what the king of the north, or the king of the south, we don't understand the glorious, we don't, Sister White, go on meditation. And Ellen White said, all right, everybody just stand back. I mean, this is how some of us think history went. These brethren would study for hours. When some of us are like, oh, proper rest time, whoosh, they, those guys were like, study time. And they were studying. I'm not here to knock proper rest, of course, but sometimes it's all right to stay up all night studying and praying. And so it is that literally they, they would study, study, study. And when everybody has stretched their brains to the max, God in compassion would say, all right. And then he'd give a vision to the prophet. And she would say, thus saith the Lord, the Lord has shown me, da, 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 let's go. And then, and the Lord has shown me, not just so I'm the authority, the Lord has shown me that we miss this verse. Even in her visions, she was bringing us back to the Bible. What I'm saying is a lot of us are absolutely lazy. We cannot exercise trust in God because the only true faith in God is a whole trust in his word. But a lot of us are not exposing ourselves to the word. Yet we want to live like Jesus and prepare to finish the work. Brothers and sisters, it's not going to happen. God wants us to understand it can't work like this. And so number one, in our communion with God every day, when we get up, when we're studying those words, when God presents his word, we ought to be like that centurion and say, Lord, I believe this and I accept this because your word said it. And I am depending on this word only to be fulfilled, and I'm not going to look for outward manifestations. 
We must cultivate this faith. You understand that? This is why in Romans 4, 5, you remember we read it last night. We saw in Romans 4 and verse 5, the only people that God justifies is the ungodly. We must accept that word, naked as it is. We must remember when men see their own nothingness, they are prepared to be clothed with the righteousness of Christ. I must accept the word that no matter how great I think I am, God says, you're wretched. I am miserable. I am poor and I am blind and I am naked. My only greatness is that God loves sinners of whom I am chief. And he was willing to use me. That's our, that's our claim to fame and claim to greatness. My greatness is hid in him. In addition to that, there's something about Jesus. I'm going to wind it down here. I want you to go to Matthew 26. I'm going to take just a couple more verses here. I don't want to disrupt the program. Matthew 26 and verse 30. You can write down the others. In Matthew 26 and verse 30, I'm going to show you something that was actually a habit of Jesus. It needs to become our habit. In Matthew 26 and verse 30, when you get there, say amen. amen. The Bible says, after the Garden of Gethsemane, it says, or right after the dinner, the Last Supper, and when they had sung and hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. You can also read in Hebrews 2, 9 through 12, that Jesus spent time in praise and thanksgiving. That is something that we sometimes, especially at Seventh-day Adventists, we don't necessarily spend a lot of time of it because we have Babylonian fears. We feel like if we start praising God and things of that nature, it seems like it's, you know, we're getting too close to the edge and we're starting to represent the fallen churches. But, I'm, and you know, if you're falling down and, and foaming at the mouth, that's one thing. But the mere fact that we're saying hallelujah, the mere fact that we're saying thank you, Jesus, the mere fact that sometimes the hand might go up and we say thank you, Lord. Some of us are like, thank you. Oh, this present truth. Can't do that. You know, we, we, we allow these cliches and terms, these perversions of understanding to mess our heads up and thwart our own worship. And God says that foolishness needs to go away. We're trying to please a bunch of people that are not worthy to be pleased. And so it is that, think about it. The first angel's message. Sing with a loud voice, fear God and do what? Give glory to him. Is that right? Watch this. Fear God and give glory to him. Whoso offereth what? Praise glorifieth me. Whoso offereth praise glorifieth me. Notice that. The Bible also says, wherein ye, greatly, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, ye love, in whom though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. <laughs> praise. Praise is something that is foreign to many of us. Many of us are very sad ventists. We're very sad people because we feel the world is going down and therefore we don't have any joys anymore. And I don't understand how we can expect to be filled with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit without measure. And one of the fruit of the Spirit is joy, but yet we're gonna be a bunch of joyless Christians. We should not be giddy and silly and foolish, but it does not mean that we cannot have a true joy that even in the midst of darkness, I know that light is coming. We don't weep as others weep. You understand that? So. Why does God want us to praise him? It demonstrates the highest level of trust. Did you know that? The more we learn to praise God, it helps us demonstrate, Lord, I trust you, even in my fires. Also, it's a living testimony to the world and angels that we are convinced God is good all the time. I know people say that God is good all the time, all the time. God is good. And, you know, we say it as this very cheap cliche, but a lot of times we don't believe those words. But when we can learn to praise him, even in darkness, in the midst of the worst fires, that's literally testifying that I actually do believe God is good 
all the time. Also, it helps us bear our trials better and makes us more cheerful. When we can learn to praise God, even in the midst of the storms, it helps us bear the trial better. It reminds us that all is well between ourselves and our Savior. It protects us from charging God with folly. Lord, what are you doing? Lord, it looks like you don't have control. What are you doing? Also, it's an encouragement to the younger generation to be faithful. Let a son or a daughter see a mother and father praising God in the midst of some of their worst storms. That is an excellent witness that we can give to our children. That they can see my, nothing is shaking my mother or my father. Nothing is shaking my brother or my sister. Also, please remember, let me get past that. I got one more slide and then we'll stop. These words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. God's not asking you to be an actor. He's not asking you to be an actor. He doesn't want you to praise God when you hate him. If you hate God, you need to talk to him about that. You need to say, Lord, I, I hate you. And I'm asking you to please help me love you. Help my unbelief. Please give me strength. You got to know how to come clean with God with your mouth because he already knows you know it. You see, confession has never been about making God aware. It's making us aware. I did one of the most incredible things in the world. One day I took a book out and I wrote out my frustrations. And when I wrote out my frustrations and actually read it, I was shocked. I was like, man, this is in my heart. This is in my heart. And it made me come to God in very deep repentance because I was looking at my thoughts for the first time. Sometimes it's a blessing to be able to say, what's my issue? And you write down your issue and you really understand it. Because sometimes we got so much drama going on in our heads, we don't have time to really think about it. But I began to write it down. And as I saw it, I was able to know how to direct my prayers even more effectively and pleading for God's help. You see, everything I just showed you right here, it's all here. Ministry Healing 253. Let us educate our hearts and lips to speak the praise of God. If you have to educate your lips to speak the praise of God, that means that it's not natural for your lips to do it. It requires education. So that means that just because you take a moment to say, Lord, I want to thank you for my trial because I know that your word says all things work together. It may not feel totally natural or whatever at first. What we're doing is we're going through an education process. This is literally what I'm teaching my children. I literally was like, children, sometimes you're not going to feel to do it. You're, you're going to be like, look, I don't, I don't feel like praising God right now. This seems a little weird because I'm used to just saying, dear Lord, thank you for this day. And please be, my you know, and it just thank you for this day. I mean, sometimes that's the most praise God gets from the average young person's prayer. Thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you for the opportunity to pray. And, and then we just go into the request. But we're training our minds. You're educating your mind. Lord, I want to thank you that today is a brand new sunny day. I want to thank you because that sunlight provides me with things that I need for my body that it can function to the best level that I can serve you. Lord, I want to thank you even for this trial because such and such and such. And you're repeating back the words of God. And the more that you do that, your mind starts falling in agreement. And your mind starts seeing, wow, this, this is true. These are the words of God. This is true. You're doing what Jude verse 20 says. You are building up your most holy faith. You're educating yourself. Let praise and thanksgiving be expressed in song. Do you like to sing? I like to sing. I am not a singer, but I like to sing. You know one of my favorite songs? We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. When you're down, sing that song. You know why I'm encouraging you to do that? That's the very song that's written in Mind Cure in Ministry of Healing. The prophet of God says that if we sing that song, that thing will cheer you up, buoy you up. In fact, song is a weapon that we can always use against discouragement. I am simply here to tell you, we'll go ahead and we'll finish it later this afternoon. My brothers and sisters, as I started studying the life of Christ, now this afternoon, I'm going to show you a real powerful secret of Jesus that gave him so much strength 
to endure his battles. I didn't get to it today, but nevertheless, we'll get to it this afternoon. I want to encourage you. God is preparing you and he's preparing me to bear much fruit, to give seed to the sower, to give bread to the eater. And through this training, God says, I need you to start learning how to exercise faith like my son. Depend on the word only, because I'm telling you, we're all going to go through what Jesus went through. Do you know Jesus went through a dark period where he did not feel the father's presence? Or do you understand we're going to go through that? Every step of Jesus, we're going to go through it. We have our own cross to bear. There are going to be moments that we're not going to sense God's presence. There's going to be trials where God is going to allow us to go through it. And we're going to say, Lord, if only I could just sense your presence. And God is going to make it known through his word. Lo, I'm with you always. Didn't I say that? So it doesn't matter what you feel. I'm with you. In volume nine, in volume two of the testimonies, page 215, the servant of the Lord says that Jesus, when he was getting ready to go to the cross, and he was crying out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He had to lean and remember what the father said. We're going to have to do the same thing. This is why I'm telling you, you got to get back to the word. And I'm not here to knock the prophet. I quote the prophet's statements all the time, but I understand them in the balance of the word of God. That's how I study. But some of us, we don't know where to go if I take Ellen White's statements out of your hand and say, all right, tell this Baptist what you just believe and say it from the Bible. We don't know what to say. And that is not good. I'm telling you straight up, that is not good. Because preparing the way is not, John did not say, and I saw another angel fly in the midst of the seventh day of his church. It goes to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. We got to get back to the Bible. And so what the Lord is saying to each of us, get back to the word, exercise faith in the word. Spend time and educate your mind how to praise me even when things don't go right. Because we're going to see a lot more things go wrong than right in our very near future. And we cannot lose our hold on God. Question. Did you understand the study today? You understood the study? Yes. Jesus wants us to walk in his steps. It's how we're going to get power. And there may be some of us in this room that says, look, I, I, I have not taken my walk with God serious enough. I've taken for granted growing up in Adventism. I took it for granted that I show up at a lot of meetings. You know, I go to GYC every year. I go to ASI groups. I go to AMEN. I go to various camp meetings. I go everywhere. And we, some of us have allowed all of that activity to define our walk with God. I watch YouTube all the time. I listen to Audioverse and 3ABN and Dare to Dream Network and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Some of us have been deceiving our own hearts, thinking that we're having a walk with God because we're living in the footsteps of other people's preaching and teaching. And some of us don't have our own walk with him. Some of us don't know him, we don't trust him. And if you can say, preacher, you know what? I appreciate that, uh, you're acknowledging that, I remember going through that. I remember young people reflecting the, the preachers that I thought was so incredibly great and all of that other stuff. I've gone through that, too. I'm just glad to be delivered. And so all I'm saying is, is that I really can relate to these things that I'm highlighting. That's why I'm speaking with so much passion about it. So please understand, we're in the boat together. We're in the fight together. But part of it is being brutally honest and real with ourselves and recognizing, man, I've been walking in the footsteps of other people's light. I've been frustrating God. I've been blocking. I know that I got my points of rebellion, that I have still yet surrendered to God. And if you know that you've been going through these various struggles and maybe are still in these struggles right now, and you're saying, preacher, please do me a favor. Can you please pray for me? If that's you, I don't want you to worry about the other sinners who need Jesus just as much as you to your left and right. I'm asking you, if you recognize that, that you please stand to your feet because I want to pray for you. And as you stand... I just want you to know Jesus loves you with an everlasting love. And he is determined and he has pledged himself with blood to make sure that you will know him as it is your privilege to know him. And he will give you strength to literally live as he lived, to walk as he walked. For if any man abideth in Christ, he himself also so to walk as he walked. First John 2 and verse 6. And God can do it.
Let us pray. Our loving Father, we thank you so much for your wonderful words of life. Thank you, Lord, for the power of your Holy Spirit. Teach us continually how to walk as Jesus walked. For this is our prayer we ask in Jesus' name.